It's good to see the presence of each and every one of you. We trust that we're here for the purpose of hearing the Word of God. I would like to say something in reference to Brother Mac Lyon. In 1950s, I remember having a friend who was preaching the gospel. He was a young man as I was at that time. And uh, he mentioned the fact that, have you heard, he asked me the question, have you heard uh, this man speaking on Channel 10 out of Ada, Oklahoma? And of course I had the opportunity uh, because of one of the members living close to the building, she had a television set, and so we went over and got to hear him. And this voice told me, he said, uh, there is the golden voice of television. And so he's been a great asset, and I'm happy that we've had the opportunity here to support him over the years, because that's been one of the greatest things that has happened to this part of the country in my estimation. Now, this morning, I would like to have this lesson directed toward encouraging husbands and wives as heirs together of the grace of life, as the scripture stated in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 7. I know that you know that many are the joys and blessings of Christian marriages. Marriage is God's way, really here, of producing companionship in this life that cannot be enjoyed as a single Christian, making one complete, that is, than what we find in Genesis, the second chapter, and in verse 18. When God made man, he saw that man, it was not good for man to be alone, but he made for him a help meet, that is a companion that was suitable, compatible to mankind. And of course this uh, made him complete in that regards. And so in a sense then, in which each spouse as a Christian, in a Christian marriage is incomplete without the other. And there he says that for this cause, well, we see that God made man, he made them uh, uh, man and, and a female, and he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, that is, for the cause of marriage, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So when Adam, you remember being the first man, the first uh, husband, and the first father, we find that he saw Eve, the first woman, and the first wife and the first mother. We can see that he said, now these are bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh and blood of my blood because she was made out of man. And so there was a man's uh, com a companion given to him as a purpose or for the purpose of his being complete. And without that, there is not the completion of marriage. So God's marriage is God's way of propagating the human life, the human race here on this earth. You remember he was said that man had to uh, multiply and replenish the earth. And so one of the joys of the Christian marriage is the opportunity then to be fruitful and at the same time multiply, Genesis 1:28 not merely for the purpose of personal fulfillment, but also we find to bring forth and rise up or raise up, we might say a goodly offspring in Malachi, the second chapter and in verse 15. Now Christian's home will see children as a heritage from the Lord. In Psalms, the 127th chapter, verses one through five, we can see that his a reward here is a, a blessing from the Lord. And he goes on to say, blessed or happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. And so we note then that it is a heritage that we have from the Lord. Now marriage is God's way of providing intimacy as a spiritual bond that cannot be 
properly enjoyed elsewhere other than uh, in marriage. Nowhere else. In Genesis 1, 27 and Genesis 2 and in verse 24. The sexual intimacy here between a man and a woman was placed by God within the bonds of marriage to be enjoyed only in the marriage bed. As Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 says that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Also a good passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in those first few verses of that chapter. The ultimate joy and blessing then of Christian marriages has little to do with this life and much more to do with the next life. Marriage is God's way of preparing Christian husbands and wives for eternity. And so Christian couples are heirs, H-E-I-R-S, heirs together of the grace of life. Now then let us notice, whenever a person becomes a child of God, then he becomes an heir of the grace of life. And we must appreciate then this blessing of being an heir at all. And then at the same time, upon our immersion into Christ, our baptism into the Lord, we find that the Lord washes one's sins away, as we find in Acts 22 and in verse 16, when the Bible says, in giving the answer that uh, Ananias gave to Saul of Tarsus, and why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And also we find in Revelations 1 and 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood. And so here we can see that we have that blessing. We have that joy of being in Christ. And here we can see that it makes us an heir of Christ. And then we notice the Lord bestows a new name at the same time. When one is immersed into Christ Jesus our Lord, he is receiving a new name, the name Christian. In Isaiah the 62nd chapter and in verse 2, and God shall call him by a new name, a name that has never been used before. And so you can trace it from Genesis to the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, and you do not know what that new name is. And there in Acts 11 and verse 26, we find that name being the name Christian. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Furthermore, we notice that the Lord adds then the saved individual to his family, the church. In Acts 2 and verse 41, and they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the Lord added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. In verse 47, he says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the baptized ones in verse 41 are the saved ones that were added to the family of God in verse 47. And so we note then that this is one of the blessings that we have when we are baptized into Christ. The Lord writes then the name of the saved in the book of life to the general assembly and church of the firstborn name written in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 20. Uh, Seven or 23 rather it is. Well, well, let us notice now what a tremendous thought that would be and is to be for those who are called a child of God. You know, it would be a wonderful thing if we just think for a moment that the Lord can profess and confess to us and God can say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. And so we have that privilege then of being a child of God. Becoming a child of God brings a host of blessings. And the greatest of which is described in Galatians chapter 4 and in verse 7. When he said, therefore we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we are with him. And so we notice then to be called a child of God is to be an heir of God, called an heir of God. Are you an heir to any individual? Have you uh, note the fact that there are people who receive blessings from certain uh, states 
from certain people because they are an heir. And if you're not an heir, you do not receive it. And so we are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. In Romans chapter 8 in verse 17, the glorious inheritance then promised to God's children is a gloriously rich, Ephesians 1.18, and eternal, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15, reward, Colossians 3 and in verse 24. That is incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away in 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 4. Now upon one's baptism, there is another relationship into which one enters a new relationship with Christ. When we think about the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, he said when one is baptized into the Lord, he is baptized into his death, verse 3. And then it's mentioned here that he is united together with in the likeness of his death in Romans 6 and verse 5. So having been buried with him through baptism, Romans 6 and 4, and Colossians 1 and, uh, or 2, 12 rather, one is raised up then together with him, Ephesians 2, 6 and Colossians 2, 12. And so we want to notice that and emphasize the fact that the words uh, from the Greek in regard to that shows that this is something that is intertwined. We need to keep in mind that it's important that we recognize the togetherness here with the Lord. So when one's forgiveness of all trespasses, he is made alive together with Christ. Colossians 2.13 and Ephesians 2 and 5. And he's made to sit together with Christ. And we find that he's made to, uh, to sit in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2 and 6. So you notice here the repetition of this Greek word sin or son, often used as a prefix. And it's in compound words as a marker of a compliment or a compliment and uh, association. It simply means with or together. The usage then of this word is understood to denote one's intimate association with Christ in baptism. And its usage will be emphasized later on in our thoughts this morning to stress one's intimate relationship and association with his or her spouse. Now then let us notice while the New Testament affirms that Jesus is our Savior, He is our Redeemer, He is our Lord and final judge, it is also pictured that He is a bridegroom and a brother. So a Christian then is one who is married to Christ. In the Roman letter chapter 7, we find that the Apostle Paul using the uh, law in regards to marriage, he said if a woman, uh, uh, if she, she's bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth, but if her husband be dead, why well, she's free from that law so that she could be married to another without being guilty of adultery. But on the other hand, he goes on to point out that you are freed from the law of Moses and that you might be married to another that is to Christ and so that we might bring forth fruit unto God. So in that sense, a spiritual sense, we are married to Christ. And so Christians then are described not only as one married to Christ, but as Jesus' brethren in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 11 through 18. And so since Christ the Son of God is an heir of God, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, then his brethren, who are likewise the children of God, are also heirs of God and joint heirs with him. And with this uh, word, then we may also be glorified together. Romans 8, 17. So the tremendously blessed relationship that comes when one is baptized is seen in these passages. He becomes a son of God, and thus 
we can see that he becomes an heir of the Father. And so we become sons of God in our obedience to the gospel. And that makes us an heir of God. And so he is joined heir together with Christ. And thus we can see that we become an heir together with Christ. So you may be an heir to some estate. But you're not the only one. There's others. And so you're heirs with them in regards uh, to this. And so all spiritual blessings we find are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 3. Now join in together the heirs of the grace of life as our text says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 7. Consider now the experience, uh, the magnificent experience here when two of these people, these heirs, are joined together. For example, let us notice now in the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, when Jesus had been asked the question, could a man put away his wife and be married to another? Well, he said, now, from the beginning, it was like this, that there was to be one man and one woman. And so we find that in verse 6, he said, therefore, what God joins together, let not man put asunder. And so they are joined together. And that's an example here. So when married, they are yoked together. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. And they are bound together, as we already mentioned in Romans chapter 7 and in verse 4. And so when two faithful Christians, separately heirs of God, are joined as heirs then together by God, the New Testament then pictures them as heirs together. And so the Greek word heir here is combined with the Greek prefix for with, together. And so we can see here to represent those uh, who are sharing in this inheritance. And now then, there's a compound Greek word that's found only some four times as it is used in this Greek uh, New Testament, translated as heirs together, joint heirs and fellow heirs, has already been noted, speaks as a Christian, as joint heirs with Christ. And we notice then that it speaks of Gentiles as fellow heirs of the promises, speaks of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being fellow heirs of the same promises. And then here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 speaks of the grace husbands and wives as heirs together of the grace of life. And so by definition, then I want to point out to you that a husband and wife cannot be heirs together if one of them is not an heir himself or herself. In other words, it appears to me that they both need to be in Christ. They both, both need to be Christians in order to be joint heirs. So you take then a wife may not be an heir individually, but the man is or vice versa. And therefore they cannot be joint heirs with Christ. And so that's the importance of this lesson uh, this morning. You know, there are those who have uh, mixed marriages. That is, the husband may be a member or not a member, and the wife be uh, a member or not a member. And many of those go well, but at the same time, they cannot be joint heirs until they both are individual heirs to the grace of Christ. And... You know, I've seen a lot of marriages and some good homes, good marriages in, in many respects, but there's one thing that has always been uh, something that's wrong with that marriage, and that is both of them are not Christians. And so they do not see things alike in that regard. And it's like putting uh, an ox and a horse together and, and working them together in that, in that way or putting a balking horse with another horse while one flies backward and the other then pulls forward. They can't move anything because they're not in harmony with their strength, with their power. I can recall back in 1952 when I was inducted in the services while we were living out in the country several miles and 
It was a real cold, one of the coldest nights we'd had, the last of January, 1952. And we had an old car there that it wouldn't, I was going to leave it home, and my brother-in-law came over and he was going to take me to Shawnee so I could, you know, go to the city for a physical and then be on to uh, induction. And so his car would not stop. He was parked right behind mine. And I didn't, I had a loose flywheel and, and I didn't want to start it again. And so went out to the barn and harnessed up the horses and brought them around and got a hold of his truck or his car and started to pull off with it. Well, when it started, it was real cold that morning and the horses hit the collar. One of them flew back and we couldn't get that car away from there because they weren't in unison. And uh, so we finally had to start mine and back it out and push it away from me so he could take me in his car to the to Shawnee. Well, I'm saying that to say this, that that's what happened oftentimes in marriages where one is a Christian and another is not a Christian. One wants to make progress and grow together and serve the Lord together so they can be together in heaven in this uh, joint airship. And so uh, you might take that for what it's, it's worth. All right. So by definition, then, a husband and wife cannot be heirs. Just as being heirs together with Christ necessitates being related to Christ, having him as the elder brother. So for a Christian husband and wife to be heirs together necessitates then that they also be related spiritually as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's God's desire then for an heir of God to marry an heir of God and to become joint heirs, 1 Peter 3 and 7. So when light marries light, they share a unique communion here with each other, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. And they also then share a unique harmony with each other, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. So when a temple Christian marries a Christian, they share a unique agreement with each other, 2 Corinthians 6 and in verse 16. So while the New Testament affirms Jesus as the Savior, and I've already said that, while well then we can see that it also shows that we have him as our brother and as bridegroom. Now, while the following passages highlight the relationship between all Christians, consider how they are enhanced even more so in the Christian marriage. Christians are portrayed here as being fitted, framed, as the American standard says, together and net or held, held together in Ephesians 4.16. They think then on the planning and uh, the strength and, and care of, uh, that was necessary to do this with all Christians. Then, of course, consider how much more special this makes two heirs who are fitted, who are knitted together and held together by God in the Christian marriage. And so as this prefix then, son, son, further details, a Christian husband and wife are fellow citizens with the saints of the same kingdom, Ephesians 2.19, fellow members of the same body, the church, in Ephesians 3.6, who are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit, Ephesians 2 and 22. And I'm not make reference to those other than just giving you the location because time uh, is not permitting that. So what a blessing it is to join, to, uh, join together two heirs of the grace of life. God knew that it uh, was not good for man to be alone and that he made for him that helped meet suitable for him. This in Christian marriage we can see God has I really provided a lifelong companion made for the Christian race, 1 Corinthians 9. A lifelong fellow 
soldier for the Christian warfare in Ephesians chapter uh, 6. Now we're growing together as heirs together of the grace of life. Once one becomes an heir of God, why well, then he does not automatically remain an heir of God for the rest of his life. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, and so on. Revelation 2 and 10, be faithful to death. And 1 John 1, 1 Corinthians 10, and Titus, or John, uh, James chapter 1, verse 17. Therefore, when one becomes an heir of God, he must give attention to, to uh, growing as an heir of God. 1 Peter 2 and 2, as newborn babes, desire the sins of milk of the word, that you may grow thereby lest he falls and lose his inheritance, 2 Peter 2, and in verses 20 through 22. So this is true for the Christian husband and wife who are joined together by God and become heirs together of the grace of life. They will not automatically remain heirs together without giving faithful attention to growing together as heirs. So heirs together can only grow together if they live together. You know, this is the uh, instruction that Peter gives here, I think, in 1 Peter 3 and 7. For we can see that uh, for various reasons, many husbands and wives today do not dwell together. And uh, so coming together can include, you know, coming together sexually as a husband and wife, in 1 Corinthians 7. In thus we can see some marital conflicts, separations and divorce are leading causes of married couples not living together. But we can also su suggest that travel, husbands and wives separate for days and weeks at a time. I recall a number of years ago hearing a man say that he'd been overseas working for the government in a in a job over there so he can make all that money but he and his wife were separated all that period of time could they grow together in uh, and being heirs of god of course to my knowledge neither one of them were a single heir of god but that would uh, prove my point that they have to be so that they can live together and, and talk together and, and be together at, at various times now, I know that there are times when a person has to drive a lot and get away from his job, uh, get away to carry out the job, but he's going to be coming back and spending more time than just being gone weeks and, and months at a time. So it's not just uh, traveling, you know, uh, for our career that keeps the husbands and wives separated for days and weeks and, and months. It's not just out of town travel, but long days and nights in the office that keeps them apart. And so secondly, we can see heirs together can only grow together if they, their hearts are knit together in love, Colossians 2. Knit together is such a vivid way to show that uh, two hearts that have become so entwined, entwined and enmeshed mesh with one another that is difficult to discern distinction uh, in them. So I'd like to mention another thing or two here. Uh, the thirdly, heirs together can only grow together if they are perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In other words, they're Christians and they believe what the Bible teaches they're of the same mind and the judge, same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. And so the health and growth of the church in Corinth was tied directly to its united devotion to the mind of Christ. So also then the health and the growth of a Christian marriage is tied together to its united devotion to the Word of God. Perfect joined together is a compound word then with the Greek prefix kata rather than son which uh, means that they put on uh, put in order restore put into proper condition 
And so a Christian couple will grow together when they devote themselves equally to a thus saith the Lord. Fourthly, we find that heirs together can grow together if they pray together. In Acts the 12th chapter, the church, the body of Christ was gathered together praying. If Christian husbands and wives then are going to grow as heirs together, they then must grow uh, together in prayer. Paul was grateful to other Christians because they were whole, uh, full, helping together uh, in prayer. 2 Corinthians 1 and 11. Heirs together must then pray together. Heirs together must worship together. The New Testament places great emphasis on uh, this. Christian assembly together to worship God. Matthew 18 and 20. Not limited, of course, to worship. Acts chapter 2 verse 46 because there are other gatherings that we might participate in. So we must place a priority then on gathering together with the church so we can have that association, Matthew 6, 33. Christians, come, uh, Christians a couple, must truly worship together. This means more than just going to church. It means more than just sitting on the same pew. We can see here that means to enjoy their mind or rather to join their minds together in heart and their tongues together to honor and praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now regarding, regarding this together, as heirs together of the grace of life, what a thought that is. Let's think just for a moment. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 17. When the Lord comes then, he'll gather together, you know, the saints. And you just imagine now that as a married couple who are joint heirs to Christ being caught up together. If they're caught up when Christ comes, if they uh, are not still alive, well, we can see then they'll be going up together in, to be with the Lord. As heirs together of the promise of God is that we shall one day be glorified together with Christ. Romans 8 and 17. As heirs together, the promise of God is that we shall one day live together with Him. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 10. So Jesus taught then that in the resurrection that they neither marry nor are given in marriage. In Matthew 22, 13. So we know then that the husband and wife relationship, you know, will not be continuing on into heaven. But, however, spending decades of, of our lives together on this earth, then just think about that we will have a home together with Christ and with the redeemed of all ages. So Christian friends of all eternity will be there as well. And so what a blessing it is then to grow together in the grace of, of Christ and be fellow heirs uh, to that inheritance. So my final word is that may God bless and help each of us as a Christian husband and wife to so live as heirs together, growing together, and serving together, that we may be uh, rewarded together with the grace of that eternal life. This morning, the lesson is yours. Should there be one or more subject to the gospel invitation, well, then we give you that opportunity while together we stand and sing.